Hi. Can I just check that folk can hear me okay? Yes, everything's fine and you're nice and clear, Tom. Uh, apologies, a little delay there, um, but we can get started as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Super. Can we have the first slide then, please? So thanks very much for uh, inviting me to talk today. I, I think I've talked to quite a few of these uh, uh, events over the um, over the the past ten years, and I was asked to kind of reprise a talk I gave last year, the tenth anniversary of um, uh, Green Mountain House. So I've updated that back a little bit, and I hope it's of interest. Can we have the next slide, please. Um, so, if just to kind of uh, cue you in, what was going on 10 years ago? Well, President Obama signed his Health Care Act. Um, we had um, the worst weather in Scotland we've had for 30 years, although I suspect there's a few years since then where uh, we've been told the same thing. There was a young couple got engaged, and a not quite so young couple uh, came to power in 10 Downing Street. You can see them there. Um, uh, looking towards distant horizons, uh, but perhaps not realising that they were in a dense forest at the time. Can we have the next slide, please? So, um, just a little bit of a focus on epidemiology to start with. Uh, it's important because it can help to shape uh, public health policy and can help us um, if we've got strategies to develop services, it helps us to, uh, to guide those strategies and um, can justify resources for, for rehabilitation. And um, what you can see there from the little table is that the instance of head injury is uh, very high. It's uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, common uh, neurological, uh, disabled neurological condition in uh, young adults. Um, and you can also see there that it's expensive. There is a large price tag, and the figures there in the UK take into account care needs and uh, effects on employment and so on. So it is a public health issue. Head injury is a public health issue. Can I have the next slide, please? And really, there's a need to bear in mind uh, the concept of, of chronic disability. The number of studies that we've carried out in Glasgow and the are also studies um, in um, Australia and the US uh, showing um, uh, similar things really, uh, uh, where we find that if you follow people up, uh, disability after more severe brain injury persists over the longer term. Certainly people have looked for 10, 15, 20 years and find that disability persists. But what's important is that it can change over time. And uh, for some people, um, it doesn't change much, maybe for about, about half of those with more severe brain injury, but in about a quarter it improves and in about a quarter they become more disabled and there's deterioration. These are important issues for us to consider if we're interested in, in rehabilitation. There have obviously also been concerns about uh, uh, long-term uh, deterioration um, um, with an, an aging population, so more people are surviving longer, and concerns that um, brain injury might result in, uh, uh, in deterior deterioration. So, uh, next slide. And um, evidence uh, for this, so that linking um, um, brain injury to long term deterioration has come from epidemiological studies or from post-mortem studies. Until fairly recently, that is, when there was a, a study uh, by Gorgoraptus et al. in science, um, uh, looking at um, PET brain scans and linking that uh, um, uh, to um, a long-term outcome. And what we're really looking at here is the deposition of uh, tau, which is a, a protein uh, uh, de uh, deposited in the brain that's associated with uh, um, dementia-like conditions. And so this is the first study to find um, abnormal tau 
in uh, brains of people who are still alive. And this was actually one of our Glasgow cohorts who went down to London uh, um, to have the PET studies carried out. But what was interesting is that um, although um, it, it, there was more tau in these brains than there were in the control group, um, um, it was not associated with um, impairment and disability. Um, and that's quite interesting because it, it suggests to me at least that there's a contribution of environment and behaviour in terms of long-term disability and uh, a potential role there for rehabilitation. Um, so can we have the next slide, next slide please? And this kind of way of thinking is backed up a bit by looking at long-term mortality. This is another study uh, in, that we did here in a, um, a Glasgow population with uh, mild head injury. And what you see here um, is we've got three groups and they're matched for age, gender and social deprivation. And the green line, um, these are, it's a, a control group who, which have never had a, a hospitalized head injury. Um, the yellow group are people who were admitted to hospital with an injury around the same time as the head injury group, but they've never had a head injury. Um, and what you can see is that they were at greater risk of dying within that 15 year period uh, than the control group, the green line. But the head injury group were at even higher risk of, of dying. That's the red line. And when we look really at um, um, medical history, we find that uh, medical history prior to and after the head injury was relevant with uh, um, history um, um, of medical problems increasing after the head injury. And so there's, there's very likely, in addition to the head injury itself, there being environmental and other factors which are important in dictating the long-term outcome of people with head injury. Next slide. And there have been many reports over the years. This is only a few, and I haven't put many of the earlier reports in there, but there are many reports um, really identifying the need for service pathways for people who've had a head injury. Um, and you'll find many editorials. There's one in The Lancet going back uh, 10 years ago um, saying traumatic brain injury, time to end the silence. Because of the very large number of people who survive with a brain injury, and return to the community and uh, often without intervention and without follow-up. Next slide. And it's been described at various points, uh, a head injury as a, a Cinderella condition. So here's a quote from Nick Alderman uh, um, about 10 years ago, despite high prevalence and the proven effectiveness of neurorehabilitation, brain injury has been regarded as a Cinderella condition for many years with treatment and care provided to survivors, being patchy, under-resourced and of variable quality. Now, this, you could take that quote, you could insert that going back to the 70s and every decade since then, right up to now. Uh, next slide, please. And um, if you want to know a little bit about um, the services in your own area, and where there's been interest uh, uh, in the event today from um, uh, people throughout Scotland. So if you want to look and see what the services are in your own area, um, you can go to the, uh, the Sabin uh, um, website, the Scottish Acquired Brain Injury Network uh, website, where they've updated uh, uh, their service mapping, and that link would, uh, would take you there and would give you information about what's available in your own health, health board area. Uh, next slide. I'm just going to mention briefly here service for older adults. I haven't given you, shown you a graph of um, changes over time in terms of um, hospitalisation. Uh, we've got data on that in Scotland, but uh, I'm putting that for the sake of time. But what you would see is that whereas the um, uh, occurrence of uh, head injury via road traffic accident has decreased markedly over the last uh, three decades or so, um, not much change in terms of assault, but has increased in terms of falls and increased um, particularly in older women having falls. 
And there's really an issue here with uh, potentially large, larger numbers of older adults having falls and sustaining a head injury because the neuro rehab services are uh, the specialist services are really designed for younger adults. And although they, they will accept older adults, um, they uh, aren't particularly specialized for them. There's a clear issue here in terms of reducing um, care costs and in maximizing quality of life in older adults, a number of whom have been fairly fit prior to the, the head injury. Next slide, please. And one way of facilitating this and enabling people to return to, to home is really via uh, um, um, assistive technology in their environment. And I often think this is an area that we haven't explored enough, that there are a number of um, resources here which might uh, enable people to return to home uh, and perhaps return to live with their partner. And this has been enabled by um, um, uh, by technology and perhaps in the future, perhaps even by uh, robots. I don't think we're quite there yet. Next slide. Um, I'm also just going to mention um, uh, an element of um, uh, rehabilitation that we uh, don't have in Scotland, and that's secure provision for offenders with brain injury. Um, the uh, brain Injury Offending Report from the National Prisoner Healthcare Network uh, um, highlighted this. It highlights um, how a service might be developed for offenders uh, um, throughout the criminal justice system, and there's a lot of work being done to uh, begin to develop that. And I've talked to this group before about that. But um, um, something we don't have is we don't have any specialist provision in Scotland uh, for offenders with brain injury. And uh, the, though they're small in number, there are a small, small number uh, where, who are very challenging, uh, who are violent, and who can't be accommodated within the existing uh, rehabilitation services, and who we may have sometimes to send down to England. There is not even specialist low secure provision uh, forensic low secure provision for people with brain injury. So it's something we need to try uh, to do something about. And the report there gives uh, uh, some recommendations about how to do that. Uh, so I won't talk more about that just now, just to highlight that to you. Next slide. So here's um, uh, something like a, a service uh, pathway that uh, uh, would be appropriate for people with brain injury. It's um, uh, uh, something like the service pathway that we've had up to now uh, in in Glasgow. And next slide. And I want to talk really a little bit about this part of it, about the uh, ex contractual rehabilitation service and the involvement of intensive new rehabilitation. And I'll explain why I want particularly to highlight that to you, why that's become uh, maybe becoming over the last 10 years a, a more of an issue. Next slide. So in Glasgow uh, and Clyde, um, we have an ECR service, and I see people refer to that service. We have about 150 referrals per year. Um, mostly they're inpatients, they'll see people from the community. And um, a bit more than a third of them would then be admitted to specialist inpatient re rehabilitation. So the units that we would send people to are two independent sector units at Murdiston, and uh, which is uh, uh, near Wishaw in Lancashire, and Green Mansion House, um, which is um, uh, in Springburn uh, in Glasgow. We also have three beds for people with challenging behaviour um, in the Robert Ferguson Centre. So next slide, please. So um, why intensive new rehabilitation? Next slide. We can go right back 100 years to World War I. And um, in fact, many of the developments in new rehabilitation have occurred um, as a result of war. And at that time um, in Cologne, Walter Popperonger developed rehabilitation centers uh, for uh, war casualties. Uh, 
really with um, um, an emphasis really on matching the rehab process to uh, the daily routine that people would have on discharge and with a kind of early version of interdisciplinary working. Next slide, please. Um, again, at that time, Kurt Goldstein, Kurt Goldstein um, uh, developed rehab centres and really focusing a bit more on the importance of psychological concepts, the threat to identity and the self as a result of um, traumatic brain injury, um, and the use of compensatory strategies, including a structured environment to help uh, to deal with that. Next slide, please. And from this developed the concept of holistic rehabilitation where the environment is seen as a milieu for the intervention. The idea that either in a day center, you have rehabilitation throughout the time the person's there, or more commonly in the UK, we have inpatient centers where rehabilitation, the idea is that it should take place over the 24 hour period, where the interaction with the environment is linked to the goals and to the rehabilitation process. Um, idea of embracing the role of the family during rehabilitation, because people will go back to the family, they need to, to support this and to continue with this and to understand uh, really the nature of the problems and uh, how, to manage them, how to manage them. And taking into account of important psychological concepts of insight, motivation, adaptation and fatigue. And this kind of developed, moved away from a more traditional medical model of physically based rehabilitation um, and working in sessions with people and really people would have a session and they would, have, would stop until the next session. So really the, the rehabilitation covering all, the 24 hour period. And really a worry that we might be moving back more towards a medical model as being the standard model. Not that medical models don't have um, don't have its place as important place in, in, in new rehabilitation, but um, that potentially forgetting the importance of the holistic model for cases of more severe disability. Next slide. Um, and uh, in the US, uh, this holistic model was uh, uh, championed by Yehuda Ben Yishe and George Brigitano, um, and um, focusing on higher functioning, cognitive functioning and emotional problems and um, George Prigatano on psychotherapy and uh, focusing on lifestyle changes and um, uh, and less so on preoccupations that there had been before with localization of brain damage and function. The next slide. And there were some early studies carried out. And what we learned from the early study was the importance of intensity and duration of treatment. So, for example, in Prigatano's unit, you'd have six hours as a day unit, you'd have six hours a day, five days a week for six months. So, 750 hours of intervention to help to do something significant about um, significant disability in people with severe brain damage. The theory driven model. At the therapeutic milieu, incorporating the environment and the family in the rehab process and with client get, uh, centered goal um, planning. Um, now, a danger really that low intensity models with poor evidence base are uh, used as an alternative to this. Um, uh, uh, and that more significant problems um, are not um, rehabilitated to the extent that they might be as a result. Next slide, please. And there are many guidelines that support the, the use of holistic type uh, intensive uh, rehabilitation models. I've mentioned uh, a few of them there uh, for reference if you want to look later on. Next slide. Uh, there's also a number of academic um, reviews. There's one by uh, Cicero who's done a, a number of them and where he's um, looked at different levels of evidence and the practice standard uh, is one where the substantive evidence for effectiveness 
uh, and uh, really finding this for the comprehensive holistic and uh, neuropsychological rehabilitation model. Um, and there on the right hand side, there are some other um, examples where there are practice standards for in his 2019 review. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the matrix, which uh, the matrix is the NHS guidelines for psychological intervention uh, in Scotland. Uh, it has a section on neurological disorders, including traumatic brain injury. And uh, you can see at the bottom there in, in the, the green and blue color, um, uh, uh, holistic neurorehabilitation, which gets an A recommendation. So A recommendations are based on randomized controlled trials. Uh, um, uh, B recommendations on uh, group comparison trials, and C recommendations on um, expert uh, uh, opinion. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what about cost effectiveness? <clears throat> well, authors in, in the Brick from Brain Injury Rehab Trust <clears throat> carried out a number of studies. And really looking, because because new behavior rehab, if you can imagine, intensive rehab is going to be expensive. Uh, but finding that really, if people go um, normally straight uh, after um, being in, in, in hospital, go into intensive rehab, um, that the costs are recouped within two years. If they come a bit later on, it takes a bit longer to recoup the costs. And the costs are in terms of uh, people returning to employment or reduction in, in care needs. Next slide. Um, so, think a little about the development in the UK of neurobehavioural rehab. Next slide. Um, and really, um, neurobehavioural rehab uh, was the brainchild of Roger Wood, uh, who was there in, in the foreground, and um, Peter Eames uh, in, in, in the background. And they started their career at Kempsley at Northampton, dealing with people with challenging behaviour. Next slide. Um, and um, developing it through a, a, a kind of theoretical model, uh, drawing on learning theory, um, and moving away from um, a model which was based more on enduring mental illness that might require constraint of behaviour. Um, and uh, next slide. And initially, um, um, Focusing on on cognitive aspects, of poor attention control, lack of awareness, um, indifference to reinforcement. But later on, moving to more to, to a cognitive behavioural model, taking more account of emotional issues, uh, the role of insight and awareness, and um, focusing on social independence. Next slide. Um, and Roger Wood um, moved. To, from um, the council unit to uh, Brainsley Rehab Trust and uh, the clinical director, and they built um, 14 units um, throughout the UK, purpose-built units um, uh, with the environmental milieu, as mentioning, the trans working with the client-centred goal planning focus, uh, and using rehab support workers that they trained specifically into the, the task of working in that environment. Next slide. And then about 10 years ago, we had um, a unit of this kind uh, opening in um, uh, Springburn in Glasgow, and that's um, one of the units that uh, we use, uh, NHS DC uses uh, for intensive new rehab. Next slide. The other is uh, um, the Murdison unit uh, uh, in Bonkel out near Wishaw. Uh, uh, apologies for not being able to get a better, better picture. Uh, and we tend to use the birth unit for people with uh, emotional uh, and cognitive problems that predominate and the Murdston unit uh, for uh, complex cases, which uh, may also have uh, uh, persisting um, uh, physical needs uh, in addition to cognitive problems. Next slide, please. Um, and there certainly is a need as we move forward into the next 10 years to develop the space further in terms of specific um, 
psychological therapies for, for specific problems, the evidence base is not as good as it could be currently, and we're needing to focus on that, I think, a, a bit more. Next slide, please. So just coming towards the end now, I want to just uh, um, highlight the threats and opportunities. Um, next slide. And we should perhaps move away from statements of this kind, uh, 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 waving a flag with this kind of statement, because although the numbers of admission to hospital are very high, um, most people make a very good recovery. And I think it doesn't gel with uh, many folk uh, um, in, in terms of presenting these numbers and, and uh, suggesting that we have some kind of pandemic of uh, brain injury in, in the community. So I would tend to move away from uh, uh, making this kind of case. Next slide. Uh, and emphasis really on head injury is the hidden disability that uh, the pre predominating problems for most people are emotional and cognitive, and so that they're not seen, and that we have um, a small but smaller but significant number of people with uh, cognitive and emotional problems in the community, which persist over the longer term, and uh, um, uh, which we need to uh, manage and help with. Next slide. But um, I'm going to come on and explain what I mean by the kind of silo labelling in a second. But essentially, if you kind of took the numbers of people, and this is very schematic, it's not, it's not a very good uh, diagram, but it gives you the idea that most people coming into hospital will require education and reassurance. They require education because um, if you have a head injury, one of the major risk factors for having another head injury is already having had one. So explaining to people about head injury uh, reassuring them that they're going to recover. But there's a smaller group uh, who need generic ward-based rehab, and they do quite well with that. There's another group who benefit from medical rehab, um, uh, and then an, a, another group which need the intensive new rehab that I've been talking about. We need to develop our service pathways uh, to deal with the different needs that uh, different people have in relation to the severity of the injury and the, the consequent um, disability that they have. Next slide. And not create a model that's a bit like this, where uh, those who are not requiring education and reassurance are mostly getting generic ward-based rehab. Um, when people are in wards, they are often wanting to go home. It's easy, uh, in many cases, to discharge them to home and to miss out the stages of the more, more specialist rehabilitation. Uh, and that would be doing a great disservice to them in terms of uh, the persistence of disability and their, their quality of life um, in the community. Next slide. So finally, um, a way through all of this is uh, via public health policy. Um, really, there being recognition of uh, head injury as being a chronic, resulting in chronic disability. And I, I was needing to um, make allowances for that in our pathway over the lifetime of the person. And we need to do this by there being media awareness of this as an issue and encouraging champions to step forward and to, jump, to champion the cause. Um, to be marketing uh, uh, intensive new rehabilitation is necessary and cost effective for some people who have um, uh, head injury. Uh, to encourage research funding so we can further improve and refine our rehabilitation uh, techniques. And the, that's a model there from the American Center for D uh, Disease Control. Uh, of, uh, development of um, how to develop services. Okay, last slide now, I think. So really, if moving forward to the next 10 years, hopefully um, uh, our prince will come and um, we will finally arrive at the service pathways that people with traumatic brain injury need. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Tom, thank you so much. Um, that was really, really interesting. And apologies um, that um, we rushed you a bit. Uh, we're starting a bit later. However, um, I've not got time for any questions at the moment. However, um, Tom um, had kindly um, said that if you do have a really important question, if you'd like to email it across to myself, I can pass it on and if he can, he will answer. Um, so thank you so much for that, Tom, because um, I know I do have a few questions there. Um, so if you can just, um, I'll pass them on to Tom and um, pick up with you after this. Um, so thank you so much again, Tom, um, and uh, goodbye. Thank you.